Okay, so so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and get started, and and <clears throat> thank you everybody for for coming over dis, despite the downpour that we had just a little bit ago. Um, so so as you know, this is our Ted for the Head uh, talk uh, that we're gonna have tonight. We've got a very special uh, talk tonight. We're gonna talk about blast injuries, which is a, a unique form of TBI. Uh, I think uh, about six months ago or so, we had a talk on TBI as well, but this will be a little bit different twist to it uh, with, with a, a great set of speakers here, which I'll announce. But a, as you all know, this is, this is sponsored by, by the Neuroscience Innovation Initiative, um, just to give that a little bit of a plug here at the beginning. Uh, this was a program that we initiated now probably two, maybe three years ago. Uh, and, and the goal of the NII was to bring neuroscience research together, not only on the Anschutz campus, but really across all of our campuses and across the state. Uh, and th those initiatives are, are really to bring different people working on different projects in the neurosciences together and to really find out uh, what's going on. Um, uh, as, as we've said in past, 80% of the research that's currently done on the Anschutz campus is in one way or another related to neurosciences. Uh, so, so we're kind of, I, I think, one of the best kept secrets in a sense uh, right now and, and we're, we're hoping to build that with the goal ultimately of establishing a neuroscience institute. Uh, so, so having said that, um, our past uh, uh, two, mo uh, two months ago, uh, our last TED talk was on dementia, uh, extremely well received. Uh, uh, it, it made it onto the AARP uh, newsletter and, and the rest. And, and Tammy now has worked a, uh, a deal uh, where these talks, uh, with the permission of the speakers, uh, will be on YouTube as well. Uh, so it's gaining popularity. We've, we've had some great talks, and I'm sure tonight is going to be no different. So, so having said that, I, I want to, what I'm going to do is introduce each of the speakers before they come up. We're going to save questions until after both presentations, uh, because I think there's going to be a little bit of overlap in, in the rest. So, Can you tell us who you are? oh, yeah. <laughs> I, hello there. <laughs> I'm Kevin Lillyhai. Uh, I'm chair of the Department of Neurosurgery. Uh, and, and Tammy Lack, as you know, is, is head of strategic development uh, for the department as well as executive director right now of the NII. So that, that's who we are. Uh, so thank you all for coming. So our first speaker tonight is going to be uh, Vic Babarda. Uh, and I'm going to read, read your, your bio here. Vic, Vic is a colonel in the U.S. Air Force. He's also professor uh, of emergency medicine uh, here at the university, uh, having a special interest in medical toxicology. He is the founder and director of the Combat Research Center uh, here at CU Anschutz. It really is a center for combat medicine and battlefield medicine. He has an international reputation, has uh, significantly shaped combat casualty care, resuscitation, and chemical countermeasures and drug development, there's a background, he went to medical school at George Washington University, did his residency here at Denver Health, uh, and a fellowship in medical toxicology at the Rocky Mountain Poison Center. He's been continuously federally funded for 20 years, is a veteran of four combat deployments, and has held many key uh, military leadership roles. He's published over 250 articles, has developed over, has uh, delivered over 200 and 55 uh, keynote speech, uh, speaks, speeches, uh, and his mission is to advance medical research and care, bringing military and civilian health systems. So we're going to hear the first of two talks uh, on blast injury, a unique type of TBI. Thank you, Vic. Thank you, Kevin. Well, great. Uh, here's big shoes to fill from last month. So I have a book I'm releasing this. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, glad to be here uh, with Kathleen. Kathleen and I have done a lot of talks together. We founded the Combat Center together. And so I'm going to take my 10 minutes and tell you a little bit about uh, the center, myself, and blast injury as I see it, um, especially related to the military and veterans. Um, so Kevin already introduced me, and so uh, as you know, I'm a full-time faculty here, uh, director of the Combat Center now, and currently still serving with the Air Force as well in this area with the Office of the Chief Scientist. 
So just a little bit on the, on the Center for Combat Research, and then we'll kind of get into some of the um, issues around blast injury specifically. You're right. Didn't, uh, whoops. It changed. Uh, it's not working. <clears throat> I think it needs to be launched from here. Skyler, you want to come? That's weird. <clears throat> Hang on. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> guys, amazing. Um, so, uh, so the Center for Combat Research, we founded about 2019. We focus on just combat casualty care or need. So looking to save and improve lives in the battlefield and back home. And when I say back home, I mean in our backyard. Our backyard is Colorado, Trinidad, Colorado Springs, across the state and across the country, not just in a deployed setting. We're looking at getting after these tough medical challenges and we bring in academia industry partners as well to solve them. Um, we end up taking, and since there's a lot of military and veterans in Colorado, for example, we end up taking these military medical gains around brain injury, around PTSD, around burn and, and blast injury, and making sure they are spread across the world through public health needs as well and better health care for everybody. Now, see, people always don't make the connection, and the work that goes into, we'll talk about blast injury, which is very specific to veterans and military, but all the investments that go into military medicine are translated directly into civilian care. So those are psychological health, those are pre-hospital care, critical care, and it's just stopped me and Kathleen saying this, um, our colleagues, and we publish this work in JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine, looking at the fact that those are connected, that military medicine investment around brain injury impacts our civilian communities as well. It's really important for us as a combat center too. Now what got me sort of into doing research in military medicine um, is through my experiences when I was deployed. So um, as Kevin mentioned, uh, you know, 14 years active duty, seven years now reserve, so deployed Iraq, Iraq, Afghanistan, Jordan, Syria. And over that time, took care of a lot of injured people. Sergeant First Class Alvin Cash was one of those folks I took on early on. And because of the care we took from him when he was an explosion, I sort of launched my focus into uh, research at the time. Um, so Sergeant First Class Cash was uh, in this Bradley vehicle when he had been driving in a rock outside of Balad. And they, got, they got struck, the explosion blew up the vehicle. He got out, no injuries. His other soldiers were still in. He realized that he was uninjured and they were all going to die in that vehicle. He went back in and pulled each one of those folks out. Um, because of that, they all got back to the hospital. When the medevac came to pick them up, he said, don't, don't get me, get them first, and then come pick me up later. Went back to the hospital, I took care of him and the whole uh, team that was there. Um, because of his work, he saved his, his entire platoon, the folks that were in that uh, Bradley vehicle. Um, so with that, he ended up dying in, at Brook Army Medical Center and he told us the story, his commander told us the story. We innovated burn care and blast injury at that night across the world through CENCOM and through the White House. And then because of his work, he, was, he received the Medal of Honor um, just two years ago, so almost 20 years later. Um, but his care was really important to us and taking care of him was important as well. And he is the only and first black American that received the Medal of Honor from this last conflict, which is remarkable. So this is where a lot of these innovations around, we talk about the stuff you see around tourniquets, around whole blood transfusions, around TBI, all came when we were at this hospital tent in Balad, Iraq. So through this tent, looks kind of raggedy, but two presidents, two vice presidents, um, three secretary of defenses, about a dozen congressmen and women and senators and many other entertainers came through that door where that white sign is, uh, this same sign here that was changed over, and saw the care that was being given. This was where we actually figured out what blast injury was. We saw many folks here with my colleague, who's now the chair of neurosurgery at uh, Duke, who would come in, they'd walk in, have been a vehicle exploded, no injuries, not bleeding, no holes, as we would say, and would go back out because you said you're ready for battle. You got no issues, nothing's wrong with you. 
And one young man, Sergeant Martinez, got injured, had no holes, no holes, go back on patrol. Um, they brought him back 10 minutes later and said, hey, this guy's faking it. You know, he, he's pretending he can't find the latrine, he can't find out where his unit is. Um, we need him to see psych. And so I remember looking in his ears and his eardrums were blown out. Again, this sounds so pedantic today, but back then we're like, uh, great big deal. And a buddy of mine, Mike Sadakis, an ENT surgeon, and Jerry Grant, the neurosurgeon, said, you know what, I think there's something here. And the fact that he's completely confused is probably this traumatic brain injury we're talking about. And we ended up using that data and several other patients and published the first wing injury paper on traumatic blast injury for the military. And since then, of course, it's expanded dramatically. So that's how I began my research in this space in brain injury and blast injury. The combat center was sort of based on some of this. We focus on point of injury and prolonged casualty care, critical injury and illness, and psychological health and readiness. And all those are connected by traumatic brain injury and blast injury as well. We then took that and with the center focused on innovation in space, looking at innovation and emission generally, adaptive clinical trials that we're going to use with the Marcus Institute, AI machine learning and engineering solutions, including wearables and blast gauges too, which I'll tell you about in a second. The center's been quite productive over time. As we expand into growing our TBI portfolio, we have on average about 70 research grants at the combat center, about 19 staff, including some that are here, about 100 investigators, about 30% of which are active duty still, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Special Operations as well. Um, a high award funding, and we have about 100 publications on average a year that come out of the combat center in this space. Now, when we think about blast injury, this is what a lot of people think about, um, and it's still an issue. In war, in the Kunar province, um, an army unit there, launching artillery, and having it being exposed to blast, or being blown up and being exposed to blast. That's still an issue. A lot of folks that we take care of still have that injury. It's really important for us to address. And we take care of those. Now, the number of casualties has gone way down. In fact, around the world, we probably transport just a couple to five ca combat casualties a week across there. So, so no longer are there as many active casualties from war, but we are still taking care of these folks who have complex TBI. So not sports NFL TBI, but complex TBI around a traumatic moment when they lost someone next to them, and then they have this, they're getting shot at after, so the PT, anxiety, and depression is associated with it. What's also going on right now is this. This is actually what's going on day to day. We would call it occupational hazards around blast injury. And you've probably seen a series of New York Times articles, NPR, others, that as these folks go to work and go to training, many soldiers and Marines, this is a type of blast injury, this subconcussive blast injury that's occurring now. What we don't know well is how it affects the body and what ways we can reduce it, measure it, and improve their outcomes. We're still working on that. But we do know there are some serious effects from this. This is Frank Larkin. Um, so Kathleen met with him uh, a few weeks ago at the Navy SEAL Foundation Group. Frank was a Navy SEAL. His son was a Marine and Navy SEAL as well. Um, Frank works with Congress on these issues specifically. He lost his son, Ryan, to suicide because Ryan had um, subconcussive traumatic brain injury and died from suicide. And Frank, as a Navy SEAL would, is hell-bent on making sure it doesn't happen to anyone else. And Frank has been totally focused on this, working with the Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Austin, to develop ways to measure it, capture it, reduce it, study it, so it doesn't happen to others. Because that sub subconcussive blast injury is occurring every day across the world as these folks train and receive those injuries. These are some of the ways we're trying to get at this. One is measuring the amount of blasts occurring. So if you're in war or in a vehicle, or if you're launching artillery, that's going on and on the entire time. We don't know how much blast injury that is and how many times it's going on and, and how much injury it's causing. Um, so there was a big push several years ago. That initiative was stopped in 2017 around putting blast gauges on into helmets um, to measure what's going on. It was mandated, right? The military says, we'll mandate this. Unfortunately, all mandates don't work out quite well, so they pulled that back and it had been a bit more uh, tactical about developing and deploying better measurements of blast injury and then looking at their outcomes longitudinally over time. 
So these did not work. So that mandate got pulled back. We're still trying to understand with other better wearable devices what that blast injury is cumulatively over time. Dr. Martinez Lopez. Dr. Martinez Lopez um, came to uh, the Colorado Combat Center on University of Colorado back in December, gave a distinguished uh, leadership seminar around different aspects of care that he thinks are important for the public health and the community of the military. And TBI was his number one, number two focus area around this area. So Dr. Martinez Lopez talking about a top priority around this area of TBI in all of its forms, because he's saying people have concussive injury through blast and also through accidents and also through penetrating injury, and helped form and focus the Warfighter Brain Health Initiative, which is looking at these concussive injuries around blast and then noting the fact that the most common morbidities around this are things that we often don't think about, the average non-neuroscientist, PTSD, depression, anxiety, sleep disorders, attention deficits, and cognitive disorders, and how we need to treat all of them together, measure what's going on, treat all of them together, and on the front end, reduce that blast injury to those folks as well. Happy to take any questions after Dr. Flaherty, General Flaherty. We love talking together, and we talk about these things as she um, shares with you the story of the Marcus Institute for Brain Health. So Vic, thank you very much. Uh, kind of your last slide reminded me of one, of one of the goals of the NII is to make Colorado one of the healthiest brain states in the country. Uh, so that's, that's a mission as well. Uh, so thank you. So our next speaker uh, is Dr. Kathleen Flaherty. Uh, Dr. Flaherty is a doctor of nursing uh, practice and is also a PhD researcher. She's a retired brigadier general in the US Air Force. And she's also Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine here at the University of Colorado. Uh, in, a, in addition, uh, she is also the new Interim Executive Director of the Marcus Institute for Brain Health. So, congratulations, uh, I, I think. <laughs> so, so, Dr. Flaherty is also Co-Founder and Deputy Director of the CU Center for the Combat Research and Director of the Combat Research Scholar and Fellowship Program. As an experienced researcher, uh, Dr. Flaherty is well published. Uh, she has uh, given hundreds of national and international lectures and keynote speeches. She has 41 years of military experience from Army combat medic to Air Force general. Um, she has multiple deployments and commands. Most recently served as interim command surgeon for the Air Mobility Command at Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. Her passion is the treatment and research of PTSD TBI and resiliency. She's provided her resiliency intervention program to more than 30,000 military and civilian heroes. And over at the Marcus Institute, they refer to her as the general. So the general, please come. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I didn't know that, so it's probably these guys right here that came up with the general. Um, so as um, Kevin and Vic mentioned, I, I, I've been doing this for 41 years um, in the military, 44 years um, in the medical profession. And so they let me start with when I was 12, so that does, does help. <laughs> and so you think about all the things you can do to get a traumatic brain injury, and one is I jump out of perfectly good airplanes. I have uh, 2,800 jumps. Um, went to Army Airborne School when they first started letting women into Army Airborne School. So to go from a private, Army private, to Air Force General is pretty atypical. But in there, you know, like us, we've had great mentors, we've had great experiences, and people who believe in us that allow us to get there. And so with that, I'm thrilled to give my talents and passion to the Center for Combat Research and Marcus Institute for, for Brain Health going forward. And as Vic mentioned, we've had a lot of deployments. And with those deployments, uh, we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about military medicine. We've learned about a lot about what we can bring to the civilian arenas. So this is up, uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield. So that tells you how long my, ago my first deployment was. Um, but also, I deployed in um, support of Operation um, Iraqi F Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom and performing the aeromedical evacuation mission, which is a very, very rewarding, um, also challenging as you can imagine. And in this picture alone, three of my colleagues from this deployment are no longer here. 
Um, so you think about the complications when we talk about not just TBIs, but PTS, depression, anxiety that are often uh, linked together. So um, one of my deployments was in uh, Bagram, Afghanistan. I had the honor of being the aeromedical evacuation commander there. I was responsible for all the aeromedical evacuation teams, the critical care air transport teams as well. And um, as, a, as you guys know, right, I, I get on the ground and I do what everybody else does. So I did uh, plenty of uh, combat missions myself. And in that, I got the honor of caring for our nation's heroes, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, coast guardsmen, right? And so, you know, caring for the TBIs, right? But a lot of them hid it. They, they buried it. And they worked uh, ways of adapting so they didn't bring those, those traumas forward so that people can see, you know, you can see them. And with those blast injuries, we know, and TB, mild TBIs is one of the signature, the signature injuries from um, Iraq and Afghanistan. And when you think about why, our body armor is pretty amazing, isn't it? Right? So we see a lot of amputees, but there's a reason there's a 98 uh, survival rate. But they come back with TBIs. And blast injuries, it's been around for a dec decade. Um, and <laughs> Vic and I were probably, you know, flew across each other. But despite the fact that there's 10 years of uh, research into blast injury, the ideology, treatment, and recovery from this still remains poorly understood. This is one of the things, there's more research in the last uh, few years than there's ever been because we've identified that as important. So I cared for these patients. I went to the hospitals and talked to the, you know, the medics that cared for them, and we see them. Um, so Raise your hand. These are all my peeps here from Marcus Institute of Brain Health. Okay, amazing. We're going to talk about this amazing team going forward. Um, but these people, um, these soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, they, they hide it, right? They can't find the tent. They can't find this, but they, and they get out, right? A lot of those people got diagnosed with PTSD. You're a bad soldier. You're not doing your job. And they'd get kicked out when really they had a TBI. A lot of times the signs and symptoms of PTSD and, and um, TBIs are very, very much similar, and they got misdiagnosed. They didn't have the teams that they, they needed. One of our combat scholars, so we have a couple um, me medical students here, but for Center for Combat Research, one of our scholars, Sergeant First Class Corey McAvoy, he was a Special Forces medic. And one of the things he said is, you know what? In training, we have these blasts. We have these blasts that none of these special forces, special forces people even get measured. And so one of the things he did is he did a study looking at the cumulative blast exposure estimate for special operations forces combat soldiers. And so what he did is he took um, four mannequins and he put a blast indicator and he put them like when these, when these, uh, when they go to training, so these special forces, when they go to training, that's uh, Navy SEALs, Air Force Combat Controllers, Special Forces Arm, so all of these special forces people. And they put the mannequins and he measured the blast of them. And so you, Vic showed you when they were doing those missions. But if you, oh, here, let's see. So, So when they're breaching this, in a day, there's four typical types of pretend explosions. And with those pretend, expo uh, pretend exposures, this is just training. So they don't even say, how many times did you deploy? Yeah, but in training, he found that all, these are the most commonly used. So in one day, they'd get 36.8. 10 is, 10 is typical, because the, as these, um, uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, when they breach, they have these explosions, right? And so what he found in a 15-week training cycle, and this is pivotal work, he said there's a gap in the, in the literature, and as a thinking clinician, battlefield, forward-facing, said, hey, we need this information. When uh, Dr. Lupe, uh, Martinez Lopez gave his talk, he pulled in some of Car Corey's work that one of our combat scholars did. The other thing that's novel that we don't even think about is that repetitive blast injury. So Dr. Barbara mentioned there's IEDs. There is just firing those big rocket, rockets and all the guns, all that blast that they're getting, all the training. Even before they deploy, they get all that training. 
So the other thing we, we have figured out, right, and this amazing team at MIBH has figured out that some of these are really high risk. And so one of them is our SWIC. So they're the Navy SEALs that rescue the Navy SEALs. So one of the things that's unique about the Marcus Institute of Brain Health, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, is these people come in with traumatic brain injuries, but they also come in with some psychological issues, anxiety, depression, and PTS, right? And I'm gonna give you an example of this. So, and I have permission from, this is our 70th cohort, so 1,000 people have gone to Marcus Institute, this amazing team that's cared for 1,000 people. These guys are SWIX, so Navy SEALs, okay? So I want you to pay attention to this next vehicle, I mean this next video. So one of them is in this boat here, one of us, they're both medics, they're in these boats, okay? This is a training exercise. Eighteen people died. They witnessed it. These are their friends, their colleagues, their military family. Those two medics in those two boats had to figure out how to prioritize, how to treat, how to evacuate them. So when you think about these amazing heroes, they come in, right? They've had these struggles. They haven't gotten the treatment that they needed, right? But you have this amazing co-located interdisciplinary team that gets at the behavior health, that actually tell the team the story. And the nice thing about this integrated co-located team is they're calling each other and said, you know, he just told me this. He shared this. He's vulnerable. He trusts. So 100% of the patients that I talk to, 100% of them say there's two things. MIBH gives me hope, and this team cares. They care, and I feel it. They downregulate, they trust, they show vulnerabilities. So an amazing team. So when you think about measuring TBIs, these people who come to us have gone all over, and people say, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. And this team, just in their evaluation, will say, oh, it's vestibular, it's oculomotor, it's this. And that gives them hope, gives them hope, and then when they come back and they live on campus for the three weeks that they're here and they go to this amazing team. And Vic mentioned this. This is, this is newly out in the research that depression and PTS are major components of the psychological changes that accompany their TBI. And we know, because we have a psychological health lead, Dr. Ian Stanley, who's done research in this field, but we know that suicide is associated with it. So the Navy SEAL who showed his son, wouldn't that be great to know this and make sure there's interventions to help these people going in, right? So amazing. So one of the things at MIBH to treat these blast injuries is we have this um, co-located, so they're across the hall from each other. These patients can get 32 hours of treatment in one week. They have neurologists and preventative med and rehab physician, behavior health, physical therapists, pharmacists, case managers, creative arts, neuropsychologists. Did I miss anybody? So I'll... What? Okay. <laughs> and they talk to each other, right? And so these people, and they, they leave and they say, you know what? You saved my life. You saved my life. And I can't tell you how many times we see, we see that. So in conclusion... Um, blast injuries, we're going to see more. The science is going to come out. This campus and, and this uh, group of scientists to really find out more information on how we treat, with, treat them. Um, it's a challenge, right, because we know, and one of the things that Corey, uh, he's our scholar, thinks about is all those cumulative, there's probably some formula that's equivalent to a really bad one, right? But it doesn't even get recorded when the patients come in. They can have tons of those. So thank you for your time and attention.
so we're going to open it up to discussion at this point, and I'd like to start out with the first question. Um, and and the in assessing uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, it's certainly in, in the uh, in the in the sports complex, sort of we've made terrible inroads into accelerometers in the rest in the NFL, and, you know, for for multiple reasons. A lot of it around money uh, that these players don't want to, don't want to be assessed. There's a little bit of work going on in the colleges. I'm curious why the military stopped the, the uh, what you showed us mm -hmm. at the beginning there. Yeah, the blast gauges. Right. So Kevin's point is asking, I said that the blast gauges were, so there was no measurement of blast injury, and then they were uh, a slow active view at the time. There was a lot of interest in measuring the cumulative amount of blast exposure um, for people just getting blown up, not even the occupational work. And so uh, they mandated that everyone wear blast gauges. And what happened was they found the data was not consistent, the gauges probably weren't the right technology, and they needed to actually find better gauges that work. So the mandate stopped in 2017, but the science and the innovation around finding gauges that work and actually add not just blast, but uh, the accelerometer and some other factors together are probably better. And so the research is still going on now in, this, in December, 2023 is where the re-emphasis driven by Congress to some extent, um, where the DOD is re-engaged with this Warfighter Brain Initiatives to find better measurement. So point of care of blood markers just approved last month, I think. And then also for um, these different types of gauges to measure the environment and the actual exposure. So the mandate's gone, but the innovation and research into what actually works and evaluation is still going on probably plussed up more now with technology better than it was in 2017, which is not that long ago. Yes, hi, I, I was wondering, we have a grant looking at uh, repetitive TBIs in, in sports. And so I've always been curious, we're working on biomarkers, plasma biomarkers. I'm curious, I would love to see if, there, if there's a difference in blast injury biomarkers versus you know, sports related. So what, mm -hmm. what do you guys think? Yeah, I, um, so, uh, again, I'm, I've done some TBI research, but I'm not a TBI researcher today. Um, there's been a lot of debate, I mean, even at the Navy SEAL Foundation where we we before about our, you know, CTE from a lot, or chronic, you know, traumatic encephalopathy from sports injuries, is it the same as a bunch of blast injuries? Or sports TBI the same as sort of military concussive TBI from blast. And I think most folks would say they're, they're different. Um, also the complexity of getting blown up is different than getting hit by a football player around the PTS and the anxiety and whatnot. So I think the, the diseases are different. Um, the biomarkers we don't know, because some of them now, the biomarkers are now that are a little more available and commercial um, have not been developed to differentiate between the two. So I think there's space to understand where you can get some biomarkers to differentiate between the two, the blood biomarkers and others, hopefully some neuropsychiatric testing as well. Let's do it. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> I think there's a lot of promise, right? That we'll, we'll get there, right? Yeah, the, the uh, psychiatric aspects and the cognitive decline aspects of, say, playing high school football in the 80s and stuff like that, that's kind of important to me right now as I go downhill rapidly. Um, th but this is a different question. So I was, I attended a, a spy conference, spy conference, I don't know, Society for Photonics Instrumentation Engineers or something like that many years ago. Um, but they had an awful lot of interest in, um, in, in this sort of TBI uh, biomarker issues. One of the things that came up was that as essentially patients, shall we call them, uh, who are in the military, in the DOD, matriculate into the VA, mm -hmm. the data are lost. Mm -hmm. those, those, those people who are amazingly studied a, a, as military personnel, that does not transfer knowledge into the VA system where we're most likely to see these things downstream. Um, is there any solution to this? And it, has that progressed? Am I wrong in my assessment of this? Because this seems to me there's a huge amount of data from baseline studies, and then as these, these, these people be, become now patients, so to speak, in the VA, where they may now be showing signs of dementia, they may be, whatever you want to uh, correlate psychologically, physically, to the TBI in, in their previous life, so to speak, 
what's going on there? Is there any information transfer? Because this seems to me to be a huge database that should flow, but it's not. When, when Am I say, wrong in that? When you say a huge database, a lot of these operators want to stay in what they're doing, so they, they hide things. And so a lot of that information is not there, right? And so um, I don't think, like, you have all the answers there. But we have, like, there was just the Veterans and Military Health Care Symposium here, and there's a speaker from the VA that are talking about ways to, to, you know, integrate that and have that available. For us, we do reach out to the VA to see if there's any records, any MRIs, any of that to, to, as the patients come here. But often there's, they're not. Well, I mean, my, my impression at the time was that there was just a block, a uh, sort of political block between the two. And I'm just kind of wondering, yeah. is, has that disseminated? Is, is it gone? So, yeah, you so, yeah I asked the question, is there solution? Solutions, yes, they need to get the data moved from the DOD to the VA. There's not an intentional block. We've been working on this for 20 years, trying to get data from folks who are in the DOD who have big assessments and then transitioned over to the VA. Historically, they just, they just haven't done it. You know, now there's one uh, data healthcare system between the two departments, which is a big deal. It hasn't solved the problem completely, but that allows you to connect inform uh, informatics to two data sets. All right, that's encouraging, because yeah. it seemed to me that there was sort of an intractable block at the time, so. Well, uh, but, but Kathy's point is, is really important, is that most active duty people will, I, I, I did it, and all of us did it, will not report, you know, you're feeling bad, you get blown up, you get stand next to a smoke pit, nope, I'm good, let's go. Um, until you're ready to get out, and you're like, oh, by the way, um, so a lot of that does not collect it while they're active duty, okay. and they're trying to demystify the fact that you can still have the exposure and continue to serve so, so, as a challenge. So one of the things we're doing is, because um, there's been some studies that looked at, you know, younger versus older, right? What's your recovery looking at? And so we're in, when is it, Irma? July 28th, August. August 8th, we're having a Ranger, um, 75th Ranger Regiment, so active duty coming that have had their TBIs, right, so that you can get them earlier, right? And so some of that requires a cultural change that we're not gonna kick you out if this happens to you. That trust in that leadership that, you know, we're gonna get you the, the help that you need. So I think that's gonna get better, and also with the communication with the VA because it's less uh, close hold, and I agree. I don't think anything was intentional, but it is, um, so it's gonna get better. Great yeah. to hear that because there's, I, I would still insist there's an immense database back there that needs to be carried over into the VA system as, as, as these, these uh, patients, shall we call them, start to show up yeah. there for mm -hmm. you. So. Other questions? Uh, I was just going to say that as a point of discussion, you see the same type of denial, you know, in active courts. You know, That's right. Sure. Yeah. Players, for example. Yeah. Yes. They will not report any Correct. professions even right. when we see them. Yes. Right. But you know, lacrosse players who don't have a monetary interest, they report to you. Yeah, mm -hmm. good point. It's a big some branches are better than others. The army is more readily and will report than some of the others. Part yeah. Of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the other things I forgot to say about that video is those Navy guys, as they spend eight hours on that little boat that does this too, so you think about some of their mechanisms of injury are very, very unique to the military. So the team does a really good job of figuring out what kind of job that they did, right? Because that's all impactful, because they don't know that that makes a difference. Well, that was what uh, Mark, Dr. Martinez Lopez was saying. He said traumatic brain injury of all forms. So subconcussive, acute concussive, sub blast, subconcussive blast, acute blast, Sports, a lot of these kids are actually the, we call it non-battle injury. The number one cause of morbidity in the DOD is not getting blown up or shot or burned. It's non-battle injury, which is sports injuries, car accidents, uh, volleyball, those types of things that are occur. Um, in addition to this SWIC thing, which has been under-recognized in the Navy SEAL group, where they have this boat and they're just hitting these waves at 70 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, which is fast. Uh, really good injury. And then the statistic I forgot to share was 19, they re report 19 to 23 percent of the people who served in uh, uh, OIF and OEF um, have uh, blast related injuries. Is there any data on things like small arms fire? I know a lot of people aren't like always artillery, but those of us, you know, we have to qual with our rifles every year. So like M249s or your M4s or whatever you're qualifying with, is there any 
evidence or data on repeated like sending rounds downrange kind of thing. Your head's right next to it. So yeah. just yeah. curious if there's anything yeah. about and, that. Because we all did that. Yeah. So yeah. well and it's people like you that said, hey, you know, what about this? That was Corey saying, you know, I've noticed this. So what about that? I, to my knowledge that hasn't been Corey was the first study that I know of that even tried to quantify any right. of the training um, noise, if you will. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. I just I figured it's yeah. interesting because yeah. everybody that goes through the military right. yep. is qualifying with a rifle yeah. or you know small arms. Or around fire. fifty cal. Yeah. Exactly. It's going over. Yep. I mean, yeah. And it, like I said, mm -hmm. it's right next to your head. Still concussive mm -hmm. in some degree, I would think. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a good point. There's more repetitions too of that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think as they get into this, which is really a big effort into these occupational blast injuries, then expanding the scope into other folks who they wouldn't have imagined have these recurrent blast injuries on, on in the ships or just using, uh, you know, at the range as well, um, and what that, those effects cause, those understudies, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think what you're doing is very awesome. I, I can tell you, from a guy that's on was on dive and flight status for many years, yeah, there's very much a they kind of hide that to stay on those statuses. I think you know, man, for sure. Um, I do want to see. I love what you're doing with the Marcus Institute. You know, we have the Center for Intrepid on the active duty side. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see how much you're collaborating with your institutions, um, just to, just to care. And it's probably more active duty on the Center for Intrepid, but um, in my patient population, I'm a PA for the active duty side, and I'm starting to see the 20 year OIF OEF. Um, soldiers come to me, and, and they are they are having concentration issues. Definitely coming from with migraines, and we I think we're doing a good job of recognizing that now. But I did want to see how much you're um, collaborating with the Center for Intrepid and kind of collecting that data and just working together as those soldiers are retiring and, and moving on to different jobs and stuff like that. I take that one. Sure. So what I can wait. Hi, my name is Irma Smith, and I'm the director for our program at the Marcus Institute. And over the years, what we've done is we were focused primarily on veterans, but now we are starting to enter into the world of active duty. It, we've always done, if they're on their term status, we've always been working with them throughout that, but now just starting to take that on. Um, so we're trying to connect more with the active duty realm. So as as um, General, Flaherty, General Flaherty says, <laughs> um, that we are really spending some time trying to understand like the Rangers and, and figuring out, we know that they're all high performers and we know that they're high hiders. And so working on a program that will help support them in that effort, but we've really spent a lot of time trying to understand what what they what their needs are. We do definitely know what veterans that, who have served, whether they're 10 years out, five years out, or 30 years out, or 40 years out, um, we're really getting, we, we have a program that is, um, I think, pretty innovative in how we treat patients and, and that it's medicine focused on their particular symptoms that they're experiencing, which both um, Dr. Babarda and General Flaherty had uh, alluded to. But it's our, it's our charge now to be able to do more of that now that we're delving into the active duty realm. So what, uh, NICO was founded by Dr. Jim Kelly, who also founded MIBH. Yeah, so very similar model. Do you, what, what do you do here? Uh, I'm an active duty PA down in um, Fort Carson, Colorado. Oh, great. Fantastic. You just came up for this? What's Good that? work. You came up just to see us? Yeah. Great. <laughs> We work closely with uh, Fort Carson 4ID, the FRCs there, 10th Special Forces Group as well. Mm -hmm. um, and their command surgeons came up and gave a brief to UC Health ch uh, Board about the work they're doing, the challenges they've had. And in fact, they have two folks coming to the Marcus Institute from 10th Special Forces Group because Recently. of what you're talking about, the integration. That was one of the expansions of the Marcus Institute is getting the active duty side. Were you assigned now, were the CFI, or were you at, at Fort Sam before? Were you? Uh, no, I, I worked in DC for a while. Okay. 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 Yeah. Sure. Well, and to have like this, you know, I call it precision medicine, right? And some of them just 
when they come for their eval and they're just like, wow, you know, I've gone, one of the special forces medics said, I got in three days what I haven't gotten in three years by just the team measuring and saying, okay, eval, this is where you need to work, here's these, you know, these areas. So that to them is life changing. But to me, it's precision medicine because they do individualized care based on this patient. They get an hour with this PharmD that goes through, you know, all these things and this DPT that, you know, identifies exactly what they need, right? And so, yeah, it's amazing. We are at a high level. We are integrated with the, with the active duty side. So General Hodney, who was a four, prior 4ID commander, Lieutenant General Air, or Army Futures Command now, they came up and met with us a few times uh, as well. But um, we have nine stars coming in the next couple of months. Um, you know, General Crossland, uh, former General Woodson, Joe Murray, a lot of, most of them are Army generals to come see the work that we're doing here. General so Bailey we want last to be, week, yeah. What's that? General Bailey came last week from uh, MRDC. So we're really, it's really important for the Institute and the Center to be highly um, engaged with what, where the DOD is at on different injuries, capability gaps, and needs assessments. And so we bring them here, or they actually ask to come, so we can show them, and we bring their patients here. We partner with RARE, we partner with USU, we partner with CFI on different research opportunities as well. I just want to thank you both for raising awareness. Um, I met Kevin at an MTech meeting as well, so I'm in the biomarker development field as well. So a question for you both. Um, do you think uh, how to help people with hiding if there was a mandatory biomarker test at intake? <laughs> Um, that people would have to take because maybe if you know that you're at increased risk, you may make the choice that this is not the best career path for you. Um, so that information might be powerful. And then um, you'll have some information about their vulnerability, I guess, more so to head injuries. So if it was an annual test, it's kind of thinking through biomarker development, would that be something that would be useful? I think you need to change the culture and you gotta get buy-in from leadership. You have yeah. to normalize it, right? That this is, this is a standard operating, this is what we do whenever you come back from deployment or after training or whatever. It's, and it will require a culture change. Because I'll say, at, when I went to Navy SEAL Foundation, and I don't know if you've read the article on uh, operator syndrome, and there's a gentleman, can't remember his last name, mm -hmm. Chris, that wrote a book called Operator Syndrome. Um, and he said, he, the Admiral, who's a flag officer, got mad at him and said, we can't get people to join now. We need them. Our country, our national defense depends on them. So he, that leadership would say no. This leadership would say, let's know where you're at. And they, right, special operator will say, I'm still going back in there. I'm gonna go do another deployment. My people need me. They're still gonna do it. But then at least you have, you have documentation for them. So do you think it would be helped if you had a biomarker that detected therapeutic intervention potentially? So there's something that you could do to lower that biomarker and show recovery? So you're, you're asked, there's two questions. One is whether the vulnerability to have TBI, and I agree with Kathleen, I've had this conversation for years around different biomarkers, proteomic markers, and that's a little bit of a challenge to have, even though they do selection assessment for different fields, uh, especially special operations, um, people feel that may be helpful, but it shouldn't be a, a dichotomous outcome from that. The different question is, if you've had injury, um, is there a biomarker to, to actually confirm it versus I think you have it, or uh, whether you need a therapy? I think that um, is, is more open. In fact, the DOD has sponsored a lot of work in that area around detection and now point of field or point of uh, care detection, and then some better markers around when to when to get therapy and whatnot, different from vulnerability. And I like the idea of pull them out of play, right? So, okay, you had, you hit your noggin, right? And you're not set to deploy, but maybe we're gonna take you out of training for this time, right? And get you some treatment in the meantime, right? So I think early identifying, and especially for those repetitive uh, injuries, right? To, to identify them. But they work with these special <laughs> operators, right? And they, there's nothing more they want more than get back into the fight, right? So I think we have time for one more question, if, we, if we've got any. I, I think that's it. Thank you guys very much. Right. That was Thank incredibly you. exciting.
Kevin and Tammy for having us up here. Really like to share what we're doing. So we've done this before, and we really appreciate being able to share it here on campus. Yeah. Thanks. There, they have some materials out there on, on the bar back there if you want to take anything that yep. you brought. And, 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 and there's also lots of pizza. Please eat. Please eat cookies. Yep. And network and get to know each other. And one final thing that I didn't mention is uh, we work under um, the philanthropic donations from Bernie Marcus, um, who founded the Home Depots. So we are we fundraise to, to do this amazing work because, as you can imagine, 10 providers for every person is very expensive. So on the site, if you want to do <laughs> donate, go ahead and donate. <laughs> Thank you.